A friend and I had gone up on the observation deck of the top of the tower and stayed out there about 40 minutes. And when we decided to come back in, we noticed something about the maps and we stayed an additional five minutes, which I think possibly may have saved our lives because while we were out on the observation deck, Charles Whitman had come upstairs and had beaten up the receptionist, Miss Townsley, and had drug her body across the floor and hidden her body behind the couch. At the point that we came into the observation room, I noticed she wasn't at her desk, but it was close to lunch, so I assumed that that's where she was. And I noticed the stain on the floor, and it, it reminded me of varnish. And so that's how I justified in my mind that must be what it was. And my friend and I stepped over it, and at that moment there was a, a movement to our right. And we turned to our right, and at that moment, Charles Whitman raised up, turned around and faced us, and he had a gun in each hand. Now, we had not stopped walking. We came into the room. We continued to walk through the room. And when we saw him, we still didn't stop. I smiled and said, hello. And he smiled and said, hi, how are you? And we just walked on down the stairs to the next floor to the elevator. Sometimes people say, you didn't think anything about the guns? A little bit, but not enough to stop and ask him a question, which might also have saved our lives. Uh, my friend said later he almost asked him if he was going out to shoot pigeons. The thing is, this was 1966. The boys in my high school had gun racks in their pickups. They had guns in them, and they were loaded, and their pickups were unlocked during school. That's the type of, of life that we lived, and so it wasn't that much of a shock, I guess, because of that. We went downstairs uh, to the next floor and took the elevator to the bottom, and as we went downstairs, the Gabor family from Texarkana went up the other elevator, and when they reception area, Whitman shot and killed two and wounded two. And then two others that were at the back were not wounded. Again, timing was so much of this, and that's, that's the shocking part. When we went outside, we were to uh, the side of the tower, and we noticed people staring up at the sky. And you know when you see somebody looking up, you look up. So we looked up, and there was nothing to see. We walked around to the front of the tower and there was someone laying face down on the grass. And people were crouched against the building. And we asked them what was going on and they said someone's shooting at people from the tower. And we immediately ran into the building next door where we stayed for the next hour and 20 minutes till it was over. There was a shock when it was over, especially when we heard about how many people were shot, how many died. There was thankfulness for being alive. There was guilt. Why wasn't I killed like other people? Why wasn't I shot like other people? It was something that at times was hard to, to understand and to come to grips with, especially the fact that I was only 18 years old and had just graduated from high school. Um, so it was, it was uh, traumatic in some ways. One of the things that, one of the ways in which this affected me was I was so thankful that my life had been spared and I determined to make sure that I didn't waste it. I wanted my life to count for something. If I was not going to die, and I was going to be privileged to live, then I wanted to make a difference in the world. I wanted to make my life count, and I wanted to be, to be worth it. And so when I became a teacher, I, I just worked so hard to be the best teacher I could, to make an impact on my students and to, um, to really make a mark in the world, I guess, is a good way to say it.